So, but the question is, is there enough food to feed the population? You know, th this is actually uh, not only a scientific question, but a political question. So, several people will react to this question differently. In my opinion, we grow enough food, but you see that, you know, a certain population don't get, don't have any access to the food and they die in hunger. Uh, it's because our distribution system is defective. That's my opinion and uh, many people don't like to admit that point. But anyway, <coughs> the, it, the, the, the moot question is that population is increasing. There is no doubt about it. But the arable land where you do the cultivation is not increasing. So what is the solution? Solution is whatever you grow, its productivity, that is production per unit land has to be higher. There is absolutely no doubt about it. This is a, this is a thing which is free of any controversy. So what are the things that contribute to productivity? That's the point. Okay. Productivity is governed by several points like whatever you grow, its genetics has to be right. High yielding versus low yielding. Okay. So that's one point. The other point, you know, uh, soil, fertilizer, water, all those accessories have to be given. But uh, the point that I'll be coming to is that whatever we grow, a substantial portion of it gets lost, 50 percent, almost 50 percent, okay. In some field and depending on the crop, the loss, loss is total also sometimes. But on the average, the loss is very, very huge. And again, the losses are of two different kinds. One is pre-harvest or during harvest and the other is post-harvest. Here, you know, storage problem and other things come in. You cannot storage, store good mango for a long time, tomato for a long time. So that's the post-harvest problem. And for pre-harvest or during harvest, you know, these are, these losses are of two different kinds. One is the loss is caused by biotic agents or abiotic agents. temperature, drought, all those things are accounted here. Biotic, the viruses, the fungi, nematodes, you know, which damage the plant and cause the loss. So my focus was in this part and that too in a very, very limited area. And from biotic, you know, there are several uh, types of biotic losses, one type of biotic loss that I has focused in and that is the vital part of it. In Indian uh, soil, there are two major viruses that cause problem. The largest viral community is potivirus, which affects almost everything from flowers to all kind of fruits. And the other is the one that we worked on and that is Gemini, okay. So and Gemini virus actually uh, affects all kind of crops, you name a crop uh, and there are other things which are not crop, maybe cash crop like cotton. They are also affected by Gemini virus. So this is also a great killer in the field. And uh, so we wanted to know how the virus, you know, uh, utilizes plant cell for their own living. Because if you understand that in a full manner, then maybe there is a chance to interfere in that process. All right. So we thought we will try to look for 
DNA replication process of Gemini viruses. Its genome is a single standard DNA genome. And if you can understand how uh, it replicates, then maybe there is, will be some way to innovate Gemini viral uh, propagations in the, in the infected plant. And to do that again, <coughs> Gemini virus is again large viral community. It had you know seven different genera. Then we attacked only the, the largest of those, and that's Begomovirus. The largest genus is Begomovirus. And in the Begomovirus, we took two different models. One, the one that goes in Mungmin and causes a disease called Mungmin yellow mosaic disease. And the virus is called Mungbin Yolo Mosaic India virus. You know, its sister is available in North India and they call it MYMV only. We did not like the name, but you know, the international community forced on us to accept this name. So, we had to go by. And the other a model system that we took was tomato leaf curl virus. These two are really great killers. So, we thought we will try to understand the molecular mechanism of viral DNA replication within the plant and that was our starting point. Uh, so, question will be how do they look like? So, these, these viruses, uh, we know the coat structure of the virus in a very uh, sketchy manner. By that I mean that you know uh, one angstrom resolution details crystallographic picture solution is still not there. <coughs> Patches of electron microscopy, cryo electron microscopy, NMR etc. Using those we know how the viral coat looks like. For all Gemini viruses it is a you know the name suggests that the two icosahedral uh, coats fused together. Microsahedral is very difficult to draw, but uh, if I draw things like that, okay, there are two quotes and that is why the name is given Gemini. Okay, Gemini is just like Siamese twin fused together, two quotes fused together. And within the two quotes, there is a there is one only single stranded DNA that moves around. For Mungbin yellow mosaic virus, two types of DNA are there. One is called DNA A, and the other similar coat, but the DNA is DNA B, single stranded DNA. Okay, and as far as replication part is concerned, we we understood that B component doesn't give any much help. B component is more responsible for virus propagation from one infected cell to the other. But as far as the replication part is concerned, all information is there in the DNA A. Similarly for TOLCV. TOLCV has DNA A and also at the same time a satellite DNA which is called beta satellite which is half the size of DNA A. But anyway, as far as the replication part is concerned, everything is there in the DNA A. Now, how do the DNA A structure look like? It is single standard DNA. So, single standard DNA and a region which is called ORI. Okay. <coughs> so, when it uh, replicates, uh, the, the single strand first becomes double strand using all the host factors and while it replicates this region, you know the ORI, uh, in the ORI there is a cruciform which extrudes out. And here there is an important protein which transcribes in this direction which is called rep protein, replication initiator protein. And it has all its action on the ORI. Okay. 
<coughs> and here there is another overlapping protein which we call AC4 because it is DNA component A and where the only one component is there, we do not call it A, we call something else. Like here it is called, you can call it REP1 at the same time AC1. If, you, if it has A only, then you do not call A, you call C1. But anyway, this is a REP protein and then adjacent with that, there is another protein which is AC2, uh, overlapping with that there is another protein AC3 and then there is a pre-coat protein and then coat protein. So, these are the coding power of the single standard DNA. Okay. <clears throat> now, we solved the, the problem. Uh, which was not known in the literature. So, I have to tell you what was known on the literature to begin with. It is a single standard DNA and uh, that all single standard DNA has to be in the form of double standard DNA before it starts transcribing and replicating. Now, that was known in uh, uh, viral literature long ago. And here, the rep protein uh, is a site specific DNA binding protein. Number one, it is a DNA binding protein and its action is at site, site specific. Okay. And uh, it has few other motifs, which is called uh, when it binds the certain portion of the DNA, you know, that DNA uh, it is normally a 9 mar area which is split. In one case it is 7 mar, the other is 2 mar. So, this is it, it causes a nick. So, this is also a nickase. You know it is variously described nickase and in our literature we will find some cases that it acts as a topoisomerase also because it nicks and then it also seals at the same time. So, nickase and sealase at the same time. But these things were all known. So, rep comes in, cuts here, so makes 5 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl end, 3 prime hydroxyl end then extended by DNA polymerase, etc., etc. That part is fine. But, you know, we knew this is a double standard DNA, and double standard DNA has no nickase activity, I mean, no nickase activity by rep. So, how does it cut? That was the problem that we addressed and solved. What we found that uh, there are sites here because the DNA binding protein and there are sites here where it likes to bind and once it binds, it binds in a very cooperative manner about a, a region which extends to about 150 nucleotide, it, is, it gets covered. And once it gets covered, then there is a lot of structural changes. And a region, a region uh, which spans about uh, spans about 50 bases, okay, takes the form of a cruciform, and the cruciform extrudes out. And that is because of DNA protein interaction. And when it extrudes out, then there are you know good techniques, potassium permanganate footprinting and other techniques, which will tell you when it gets in the form of a, a uh, extruded out form, what are the bases that are opened? So, which are the basic single standard bases? So, we found that this 9 mar becomes completely single standard. Okay. So, from the double strand, you get a structure where the 9 mar is completely exposed in the form of a single strand, so that it can nick that area. It nicks and then the replication can start. So, we solved the problem of replication initiation I would say. This is one part. We solved the replication initiation problem. 
but once it, it is cut, then the other enzymes has to take over, okay. Uh, that uh, then polymerase has to, uh, you must have learned in the class that if it is double stranded DNA and then if there is a nick, he prime hydroxy layer needs to be extended by the DNA polymerase. But the problem is that uh, it is still double stranded and there is a nick and that uh, there are two strands, the one strand needs to be moved out so that other strand could be copied, okay. And this activity is called the helicase activity. What is the helicase? Nobody knew before us. So we found out that the rape protein itself acts as a helicase activity. So from replication initiation to uh, the very first step of replication elongation, was solved by us, okay. So once we did this, then we, we thought that, uh, well, <coughs> the, as far as replication part is there, uh, more or less we understand, okay. But the point is, if it has to replicate, only these proteins on do. Moreover, See here, pre-coat protein and the coat protein, uh, they, they have a role on replication, but not in replication initiation or replication elongation. As far as replication initiation is concerned, a region which is from here up to there is just good enough. Is about 2.7 kb DNA and the region about 1.2 kb is good enough for replication initiation activity. So for replication initiation, replication elongation, you do not need this DNA. You can you know, stuff in any DNA sequence you like. But to us, the main question was that for replication, you have a rep protein. This AC2 protein helps a bit. Sorry, AC3 protein helps a bit. It is actually an enhancer. It enhances replication efficiency. So, is it possible that with the help of only two proteins, this guy can replicate in the plant cell? No, it is a virus. So, it has to utilize a host of host factors. So, the big question is, what are those? Which are recruited during replication initiation. And uh, actually, there is, there was no formal thing that we had in our hand. So we had to devise everything on our own. If you want to know a uh, host factor, you know, then typically in animal science, what everybody does, uh, studies the animal cell and takes a mutant of it, okay. In mutant, some mutant it replicates high, in some it is low, and then you know that particular factor has some activity. In plant, we did not have that. So now, we had to devise how to get the host factors important for viral DNA replication. For that, we came up with the model first, which we call East model. East genetics is very much worked out, okay. There are about 6000 proteins. For each protein, mutants are available. So we wanted to know that if we can make uh, this viral DNA replicate within the yeast, then we will crack another big thing. Because then you know, the same thing will propagate in different mutants and get to know what are the factors. So there was a technique uh, using which we could we could, we could, we could make use of the yeast or yeast factors for replication of this viral DNA within yeast. So we developed this thing, okay, yeast model. And uh, <clears throat> our idea was that why, why you wanted to go for yeast? Our idea was that during replication initiation, be, uh, in, in the replication, there are three different phases, replication initiation and the replication fork elongation and termination, 
okay, with the application fork termination. There are three different steps and each has different sets of enzyme machinery. This is the very specific for any system. For this viral system, it will require factors which is extremely virus specific. There could be host factors which might help in there, but the viral factor REP is the most important one. So, in the replication initiation part, <coughs> sorry, we thought there is a virus factor, but in the fork elongation part, you know, fork elongation part will be controlled by the host factors. And uh, this is kind of a conserved, conserved by conserved, I mean, whatever yeast will have, Drosophila will have the same thing human will have the same thing, plant will have the same thing. So, in replication elongation, there will be factors which will be shared by, you know, many organisms. So, yeast might have that and that is another reason why we went for yeast model. <clears throat> so, we, we knew how to grow the viral DNA within the yeast, there are several assays. Masses are very simple, it is simple colony forming ability within the yeast along with the known selectable markets. And in that way using yeast model, we found that there could be more than 100 host factors, okay. And these are all known replication factors in the eukaryotic kingdom. So, this information we got and also we characterized in a few, 7 or 8 out of 100 because obviously you cannot do 100, you know, justify all the activities. And then later on we developed several other things. That is, we, we, we came up with that idea that this is, if this is the most important enzyme, one has to know that what are the rape interacting factors. Okay, that there is a techniques for protein-protein interaction, the yeast to hybrid technique. Using yeast to hybrid technique, we we found a set of factors, which in set of host factors which interact with the rep protein. Okay, a set of factors which interact with the AC3 protein because these are the true viral factors, and we found many of those factors are there within hundred. But you know, it, it, it extended the domain also. There are few other leads that we got from two hybrid approach. So this too, and there was another quick and dirty approach which is called phage display assay. The idea is same that what are the factors which interact with rep or AC3? And there we got you know many, many different factors. Uh, by 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 phage display approach. But the point is, like you know, whether all those things, so this is this is something where the real cells are very different. Okay, do these factors really work within the plant? That is the question we asked and then we came up with a model which is called plant model. And uh, tobacco, sometimes tobacco, sometimes Arabidopsis, sometimes tomato was used as a model. The model is that you know we took uh, this part, the replication, uh, the, the, the part that is necessary for replication that is from here up to AC3, okay, and then designed a specific vector. So, and uh, that part when introduced within the plant can act as a viral episome. So, that will be a mini uh, Gemini viral factor, okay. So, this is a mini, mini viral uh, episome 
that we can develop within the plant. And then the ways to make mutants, you have siRNA and all those things, okay. So, using those things, you can verify whether these factors are important for virus to replicate within the plant. So, you had all the approaches. Taking everything together, uh, while I was leaving my laboratory retirement, we had about 172 different host factors about which we were very sure that at least it has to have 172 different host factors for its replication. Uh, and then what do these factors do? Some are well characterized, some are not. But the point is even if it is well characterized, you have to find how it really helping Gemini viral DNA. That part you have to address. So for that, you know, we could address only uh, seven to eight different proteins, and uh, and then and then and then found their biochemical characteristics, and we found how these seven to eight different proteins are helping in different steps of replication initiation and replication elongation, like Rat54, Rat51. Uh, a few others, I forget the name, PCNA is one of them, okay. So, in that way, um, RF uh, replication factor, you know, this, this single standard DNA has three different uh, subunits, one of the subunits 32 KDA. So, we found that is important. So, about 7 to 8, you know, we knew uh, how they are working as far as DNA replication of plant Gemini virus is concerned, okay. <coughs> and uh, if anybody is interested in DNA replication now, <laughs> Gemini viruses, the uh, rest of the factors can be handed over to them. Sir, uh, you discussed about the role of the rep and AC3 and all. What and you said that they are involved in the initiation and the elongation. You said, uh, can you elaborate something about the role of the coat proteins? What role do they play in this? Uh... Coat protein, okay. In the replication, you know, it does not, uh, in these two processes, it does not have any help. But coat protein, see, well, while a viral DNA enters in the cell, the first thing to synthesize was is the rep protein, okay. And coat protein is synthesized late, so this kind of late protein. And once it is synthesized, uh, its activity will be to package the viral DNA. If you want to pack the viral DNA, then obviously you have to put a stop to the viral DNA replication process, okay. So we found out the molecular mechanism how coat protein it gives a signal to stop viral DNA replication. So, it, it is more like a termination factor, the coat protein. Uh, one thing I always wondered, you know, and I really do not know the answer to that question. And when the students ask me, I have to cook up something. So, I gave many hand waving arguments, but I am really not satisfied about it. The point is, if you look at the uh, profile of all kind of RNA, all kind of viruses in case of plant, 99.95 percent of them are RNA viruses. Uh, obvious question is why, okay. Uh, is there something inherent in the plant uh, and, and, and maybe I am not sure how, but uh, what I think now that as the as there are RNA interfering factors present within the plant cell uh, or they have developed in response to the RNA viruses. Maybe RNA viruses were around and that is how RNA was developed or it could be other around that there were RNA factors were there and uh, others were eliminated because of the presence of this and only RNA viruses are left around. I do not know which way it is true. but the very fact that there are majority of the RNA viruses tells you that RNAi has a role in their regulation, evolution and what not. When, 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 uh, when you look at any, any plant you know, or other any plant virus, its host range is very narrow. There are so many different types of plants, but majority of them remains unaffected. So, plant virus resistance, I would say, a default pathway. Virus sensitivity is a very specific object. 
in some plants have become sensitive but most of the plants are either immune and then and, and they show non host reactions but anyway uh, it's fine but when uh, you really see that you know crops in your field are devastated then uh, you don't get satisfied by that intellectual satisfaction that you know the virus is our resistance so if if uh, there are factors within the plant which are responsible to handle the rna viruses then you have to deal them well so that whatever sensitization is there that can be handled okay in the case of uh, <coughs> in the case of uh, prokaryotic system you know the viruses are taken care of by you know that modification methylation system okay so a foreign virus comes in it leaves a signature and that uh, methylation modification system removes them but in the eukaryotic case it, <coughs> it is not there so it has developed another type of mechanism by which it can resist the viruses and here the rna factors come into action so i learned that no matter uh, how many factors we describe as far as viral gene viral dna replication is concerned host will always try to down regulate them so if that is true then better look into that approach so that you can use that down regulating thing to stem the viral uh, proliferation so that was the approach <coughs> uh, okay and then there are there in many different types of you know, classical examples that uh, why rna factors are there to has evolved you know to down regulate the viruses but another in it has the corollary question is that resistance is fine but there is also sensitivity how does sensitivity occur and our approach was that the viral factors which will trick down which will downplay rna factors will be the most important one they will be called you know pathogenic agents or whatever so these are the important viral things which cause disease what are those factors and we found out that uh, almost all of those factors are rna suppressors and that's how you know, i i landed into rna area okay and rna i relies on three different types of small rna si rna micro rna and then pi rna in the case of plant you know but still there is no detection of pi rna there are bioinformatic persons here so they might you know take a look why is there any you know, is there something which has not been looked into are we missing the pi rna somewhere you know i don't have answer to that part but si rna and micro rna part we understand okay so these are the small rnas which using the rnai factors down regulate any target gene of interest si rna and then micro rna okay uh, as far as viruses is concerned when a plant virus gets into a plant cell and you will find that from the viral genome from all over the viral genome si rnas are created and this si rnas act to down regulate the viral warps so that's how uh, a plant is always defending itself against the viral attack so this si rnas are important the, you might ask where from the si rnas are coming because in the viral uh, what if whatever signal is there to make a simple rna an rna is single stranded okay where from si rnas are coming in okay the the answers are you know <coughs> are of different types one is 
you might have seen that in the uh, our DNA virus, uh, AC3 protein was going in this direction and coat protein was going in this direction. So, the replicate the transcription was convergent. So, one RNA is going in this direction, the other is in this direction. So, there is a possibility of having duplex. This is number one that is convergent transcription and secondly, so the, the convergent transcription will have double standard RNA and the double standard RNA will be cut by the dicets and they will give rise to SI RNA. So, this is uh, one possible source. The other source is host always have something which are very important and those are called RNA dependent RNA polymerases. So, if you have a RNA template, then using all the in the Arabidopsis are six of those, okay, six of those, and uh, any of them can take up that RNA and transcribe it, transcribe, copy it so that you know it can make a double standard RNA. And once there is a double standard RNA, the dicers will give rise to SI RNAs. Is that part not clear? So, uh, and out of this, you know, there is a hierarchy. In some cases, one type of RNA dependent RNA polymer is, is more active than others. In majority of the cases, RDR6 is the enzyme which is more important in converting single strand to double strand. So, the viral RNA is concerned, this is a RNA. <coughs> and micro RNAs are something which are encoded by the host, okay. Uh, like any gene, you know, my, uh, the how many genes the human uh, genome will have? 25 to 30. Plant, again that range and that is an amazing correlation, you know majority of different types of genomes are sequenced, you will find that the, the organisms are very different, the complexity is very different, but the total number of proteins that they are making a kind of same and they have lot of homology like uh, rice will have 53 percent animal protein. Okay, so, there are a lot of homology, but in spite of that there are a lot of differences, but here is micro RNAs that are, are called non-coding RNAs, they are portions of the gene from which RNA is made, but no protein, that is why they are called non-coding. RNA is made and then RNA is handled in different manner, that once for micro RNA gene, RNA gene is made just like you know mRNA genes, this is POL2, POL2 RNA polymerase makes that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, that RNA and that RNA folds in a stem loop type of structure, okay. And that stem loop is cropped out by an enzyme which is mostly dicer, dicer like enzymes. So, after this cropping out what is left that is called pre micro RNA. So, you have a micro RNA gene that is transcribed, it folds and then first processing happens, you get pre micro RNA. Pre micro RNA then has clear cut double standard RNA, okay. there could be mismatch bulges, but also at the same time there will be a loop, the stem and loop structure. And the stem and loop structure again with the help of set of dicer and dicer binding enzymes, it is cut. Okay, cut into 22 nucleotide duplex pieces. So, one would be mature micro RNA and its uh, antisense will be called micro RNA star. Out of these two, one gets lost very quickly, the other remains stabilized in the plant, in the plant or animal system, whatever it is, and that is called mature micro RNA. Okay, so, that is the biogenesis. And this mature micro RNA in their turn, you know, acts like a uh, rather mature micro RNA uh, makes a complex with the RNAi factors 
and those complex is called a risk factor. Okay. And that risk factor acts like a site specific endonuclease in the case of plant. And that site specific specificity is given by the mature microRNA. When mature microRNA knows what is the other microRNA to pair with, there the site specificity comes in. And within the RICS, there are proteins like arginate, which has RNA's activity. It cleaves the target mRNA uh, at the right place. So it uh, down regulates the target mRNA. Okay, so that is how the mature microRNA works in case of plant. There are other pathways, but that is the dominant pathway. 